Questions about various aspects of Sufi thought and teaching come to Idris Shah from all parts of the world. This cassette contains his answers to a selection of them. Idris Shah is a Middle Eastern thinker whose work has created enormous respect in established circles, as well as challenging customary thinking and current assumptions. His 16 published works are much used by scholars, as well as commanding a wide general readership. He has recently been appointed guest professor in intercultural studies at the University of Geneva. Here is Idris Shah answering some of the many questions sent to him. Mr. Shah, what is the least constructive reaction that you find in people who read your materials or hear you talk? The almost hopeless one is when they read or learn, as they call it, selectively. Instead of absorbing all the points given to them, they choose something which catches their fancy and they try, try to act on that. It's as if you've started to tell someone about the advantages or possible uses of electricity, which they'd never heard of before, and then they can't wait to put their fingers into a wall socket because they've gathered that electricity has great value. It, it's often said that you're against scholars and scholarship. Uh, why is this, since many scholars are so anxious to recognize the importance of your work? I'm not against any scholar, and I've often said that. I'm against the consequences of the narrowness of inferior scholars and their oversimplifications, because these are extremely misleading. But this is widely recognized, as you've intimated, by real and useful scholars. A bad scholar is much worse than none, and a good one is priceless. Fortunately, there are many good ones, and one is contacting and interchanging with more and more of these all the time. Bad ones tend to study so selectively that they end up by warping the subject. It's said that you hold that to lecture or give interviews can be harmful not to yourself but to others. How can this be? Lots of societies and other bodies ask me to lecture. Experience shows that audiences often lack basic information about Sufi thought and also about standard human reactions, or else they only have limited and highly selective knowledge. As a result, they apply inapposite reactions to the material and constantly ask for basic information which is abundantly available in print, which they could have familiarized themselves with beforehand. The harmfulness comes in, as an example, when the audience or the interviewer feels that he's being preached at or regarded as uninformed, when without basic material or through his own bias, he's constantly making mistaken assumptions and even drawing erroneous conclusions. It's often said in the literature on this subject that one's experience of Sufism and Sufis is contrary to one's expectation. So that people who are, for instance, disappointed are so because they have expected stimuli which are social and not spiritual. But since this is so often said, can it still remain contrary to expectation? Surely it produces the expectation that one is going to meet something unfamiliar or even undesired which may in fact be the right thing. This would possibly be true if one could guarantee that merely publishing something or repeating it would ensure that people took real notice of it. People are generally and demonstrably surprised by Sufi impacts precisely because they take no real notice of the information level of their own reading or hearing. They tend to listen for what they want to hear. It remains contrary to their expectation because of this and because they so often have not aligned themselves with the difference between their emotional and social desires and their, what we call, nutritional ones. Selective reading of the old Sufi books, where the uneven study of the materials is so often said to be bad, does not, of course, help them. You do not comment on what are so often called burning questions of the day, and you don't involve yourself in topical issues. Why is that? perhaps because nobody has convinced me that the only way to contribute to the world is to scream and shout and so on. Under what circumstances would you involve yourself in such questions? 
if such activities were not already adequately represented by admirable vocal and highly gymnastic individuals. The converse, however, is to me equally true. It's because I'm doing my job that they can do theirs. I believe that there has to be a balanced selection of people carrying on different necessary jobs. You have no cult, no fixed body of ideas to which you require people to subscribe. Why is this? First, because I have no personal need to be a cult figure. Secondly, because I couldn't work on so wide a basis if I were to limit myself to the attention of people who could be induced to join or sympathize with a cult. Our activity will not willingly rob itself of people who can contribute and to, to whom a contribution can be made. Would you please expand on this? Cults now are mimetic, that is to say, they copy the behavior of other cults or of other groups of people. This is true both in the East and in the West. Among the Sufis generally, we have no real cults. This is because, to us, cults are social and not spiritual activities. We have no fixed body of ideas primarily because fixed bodies of ideas tend to lead to exclusivism and narrow-mindedness. They are useful enough as a substitute for perception or knowledge, and indeed this may be better than nothing, but to us it is what we call a crystallized stage. As for requiring people to subscribe, there's a presumption there that they understand what they are subscribing to. If they don't understand, they're indoctrinated, and we don't indoctrinate. If we subscribe, we subscribe to methods and not to implanted obsessions. Are you trying to avoid becoming a vogue figure because such a role is too short-lived for you? I would say that such a role stands in the way of communication. How do you discourage conversion and people adopting you as a guru figure? Deny a weed the nutrition it seeks, and it will wither and die. In the case of the human being, he'll soon turn to something else if he finds that his adopted guru is not listening. Now, of your 16 published books, five have appeared within six months. Can the reading public take up this number, and how do you do it? As to how I can do it, if you've been working on something and improving your efficiency in it for 30 years, you should expect to be productive. As to whether the books can be taken up, there's no slackening in the demand as far as I know, rather the reverse, probably because they cover so many specialized areas as well as being bought by the general public. What are your sales? At the last count I heard, 20 copies an hour in all editions and in the various languages in which the books appear. A book of Middle Eastern tales or a run-of-the-mill travel book or a book on Eastern mysticism will ordinarily sell only a couple of thousand copies and may sell many less. Do your sales not appear phenomenal? So people say. I imagine, though, that these other books that you've mentioned sell so few because they don't have enough general appeal. What kind of people write to you after reading your work? Oh, the classic Duke to Dustman range. And which of these do you find most interesting? The ones who are not imagining that I'm a guru and so can look at the materials and not at what they imagine I might be. Your books show that you've traveled and lived in 20 different countries, have been the guest of kings and heads of state, and you speak uh, several languages. Doesn't all this stamp you as an unusual person? These, to me, are some of the tools of one's trade. I fancy that anyone who tries to do something must be well enough equipped to give it a fair chance of success and must be prepared to put in whatever time is necessary to do what he has to do. I doubt whether the matters just referred to are in any way greater or different from the requirements of any other inquiring, mobile and active person in many fields of life. 
Put the way you put them, they may seem so, but what about the advantages and capacities which I lack? How many tales and stories have you published so far? How many have you worked with? About 500 are published. They have been collected from 17 countries. One selection of 80 stories is summarized into a 90,000 word book from an original body of 800,000 words. This range is itself taken from collections amounting to 1,200 separate tales and recitals with redundant tales removed. In the way of the Sufi, I had to examine 3,000 extracts to r arrive at the final cross-section. Most of the tales in Wisdom of the Idiots are from manuscript and oral sources and have not been published before. The tales come from Persian, Pashto, Urdu, Turkish, Tatar, Arabic, and lesser known dialects and tongues like Badakhshi, Pashoi, and Brahui in Central Asia. For uh, forthcoming selections of illustrative anecdotes, I've collected 4,567 different pieces, either at first hand or through correspondents who've summarized and tape recorded them from the tellers, from which a final selection of some 10 to 20 percent of items is to be expected. The oral literature is dying out for the usual reasons. N then you've consulted with very many Eastern authors. Oh, yes, but specific authorship in the East has not been as closely linked with inventiveness and property interest as in the West. Many authors tackle the same theme or story or try to excel in the version rather than in the plot. So there are hundreds of authors and author craftsmen and very numerous attributions. It's not possible to talk in numbers of authors. Remember, the authors have been trying to ensure the continued currency of the knowledge contained in the story and not to establish a property right. Do you get much adverse criticism? In the press, my last 162 reviews show two hostile criticisms. From other sources, I get as much criticism as the reverse. Of course, opinions tend to cancel one another out. What is the origin of most of your adverse criticism? I would say that it's the all soup has lumps in it syndrome from which we all suffer from time to time. <laughs> I don't know that quotation. It's from a story. Someone once tried to give an oafish yokel some excellent but rather smooth soup. And the yokel said, You can't fool me with your city ways. I know that all soup has lumps in it. Oh, I see. Something like give a dog a bad name and hang him. Yes, except that it's unconscious. When you actually meet highly critical people, they often realize that they must look elsewhere for any monster which they have been needing to believe exists, and therefore their hostile criticism is correspondingly reduced. Do you get any interest in what you're saying from members of established churches? Yes, a very large number of inquiries and callers from professional and lay members of, I believe, virtually every confessional congregation. Would you say that there was anything special or characteristic about them? They undoubtedly divide into fairly well-recognizable categories of people. The most common feature of the inquiries is that it is hoped that I might supply something which can not only be reconciled with their existing framework of belief, but that I should also supply them with information which would show that what I am saying is in fact only a neglected part of their own tradition. How would you characterize such an attitude? Most often it's prompted by people who want to get something with which to shore up something else. But they also want to be told that they're not shoring up but that they're getting to the foundations of the edifice. Then it's a psychological or personal and not a religious need here. Not always, but almost always. Um, do you mean that you're not reintroducing lost or misinterpreted materials from our known Western systems? Many commentators have indeed found this characteristic in what we're doing. But we are, in fact, working for the people of today and not as historians or museum keepers.
quite a number of writers, poets and social scientists and others, have said that your materials have great relevance for our time. How can this be reconciled with the fact that you are using traditional materials from the Middle East? I am, to some extent, using technical documents and research theses from the Middle East because they may be in poetry and perhaps couched as folk tales or have an in entertainment content, people imagine that they're not precise and scientific productions. That reaction is, of course, only part of the all soup has lumps in it mentality. With a vast reading public, you must receive a lot of letters, fan mail, as it's called. Uh, do they reveal anything in particular? The oddest thing they reveal is that so many people who write say, I simply must meet you, or something like that, but turn out never to have read any of my books. But reactions are not always as shallow as that. One of my most memorable experiences with audiences in Britain was being received at the University of Sussex with such enthusiasm in the School of European Studies and not regarded as an oriental curiosity. A quite voluntary collection of Sussex students and dons listened to my seminar and then, although completely new to my subject, instantly understood it and asked the most interesting questions. But you don't get this kind of understanding in general, then? You do get it, but it tends to be ritual. When you enter the circles of thinkers, you have to carry out all kinds of ritualistic processes before you can get down to the heart of the matter. You have to scrape off the accretions and get rid of the folklore and the assumptions. And yet you sometimes appear to attack academics. I have a million words in print, and those few querulous academics, when they say I attack them, are relying on misinterpretations from this million words. I've never, of course, attacked scholars, although some of them sometimes imagine I do. As to why they should imagine this, you must ask them. I've mentioned some drawbacks to narrow academic thinking, but this is also known to all scholars. Rather than an attack, it is intended to be descriptive. If you say, this man has appendicitis, and you're a doctor, what kind of patient jumps up and down and says, you're attacking me? Remember, too, that it's academics who've given me university platforms, and academics who write commiseratingly when narrow scholars attack. So there are pluses and minuses in everything. Do you answer such criticisms? Since I did so once, I haven't had to do so again. What I said then brought back a few shouts, but I noticed that the opposition has become very much more subdued and careful lately. You write a lot about experience. Are minor experiences worth anything? Unexpected incidents offer us the best source of useful experience because they shift our attitudes. They put us in another position. These are usually very minor ones. Can you quote one? Recently, I was billed to give a lecture in a certain town. When I arrived, there was a taxi strike on and my hosts had to hire a local hearse to take me to the lecture hall. As we passed through tree-lined roads with posters advertising my presence on the trees, I had the unique, to me, experience of looking alternately at pictures of myself and the people in the street automatically raising their hats in respect for the dead as they saw the hearse. There's an enormous amount of food for thought here. How, in this instance, are you using the word thought? By thought, I don't mean just puzzling things out or intellectual games or emotions like the perception of strangeness or humour. I mean what happens in your mind when you are in a strange situation. What happens in many strange situations, if you resist using them just to amuse or divert you, is that your understanding may be increased, your understanding of what lies behind appearances. As Sufis say, the true reality behind what most people believe is reality. Can you tell us one basic thing that people need to include in their daily lives? One thing which could take the sting out of many a disappointment and which does explain 
innumerable situations which people find baffling is the question of attention. Man constantly seeks attention, and this need is present in almost every human situation. But at the same time, man conceals the fact, especially from himself. The result is that he often cannot understand what is happening to him. Attention is an intake, like food. A primitive man might not know that he needs food, so that he could mistake hunger for something else. As a consequence, when he felt certain pangs, he would be affected by them in an unnecessary way. Instead of saying, this is a signal that I need food, he would, through hunger, become angry with all its consequences. He might even think that he was ill. He might even think that he ached for higher fulfillment. Do you find any characteristic of human societies in the past uh, which is not represented in ours? All societies, from the most primitive to the most advanced, have created their own heroes and authority figures, mainly by conditioning people to respect certain forms of conduct. Many of the heroes, too, have been conditioned by the systems to act in an heroic way. But when they behave as they've been trained to do, the society, oddly, doesn't say, that was a successful experiment in conditioning. It says, how wonderful that a person could do that. In modern society, people are still rewarded, like trained rats in a scientist's laboratory, for doing what they should. But the knowledge that people often can't help behaving like this is available in modern society. This, I'm sure, is bound to modify all ideas about merit and achievement. You choose your material from distant cultures, remote times and unfamiliar places. Why are there no parables, similes and quotations from the West? Because it is in the East that some of the problems facing us here today are known to have been met and solved ages ago. Examples do exist of this kind of thinking here in the West, but they are less abundant and more difficult to employ. Is the East, then, in your opinion, more advanced in psychology than we are here today? It's not necessary to be more advanced to have specialized in certain forms of study. They make carpets better in the East and tweed better in Scotland. Since for so many years Sufism has been, erroneously I know, associated with morbid mysticism and incomprehensible dervishes, uh, don't you find it difficult to promote it under this name? I have often been asked this question, and without wishing to appear discourteous, I think that we can learn something about the state of mind of the questioner by examining it. You, for instance, are English. Suppose someone were to say to you, in the country or age in which we live, English people are thought, erroneously I know, to be undesirable. Wouldn't you rather call yourself a Japanese? What would your reaction be? Look at this table. Less than a month ago it was shabby, broken, dull, and one might have thought, ready to be thrown out. Someone, however, has refurbished it, bringing out all its beauty and utility until there's nobody who would not regard it as an asset in any home. Suppose he had said instead, why not throw the table away and get a new one? Why have a filthy old thing like that about the house? What would have happened? It's true that the word Sufi is used in a very different way in this country of late, but I and others have travelled in the East in search of spiritual teaching and have lived in several Oriental countries. But in the end, I had to come back to the West. The East is full of exploiters, of disappointments, and of people from the West who imagine that they are spiritual, whereas they're really nothing of the sort. Is it worth going through all these journeyings and searches, especially when the whole thing might be untrue? You want something from the East which you've heard about and attempted to find. Now look at it another way. Look at the problem of someone else, someone who came to the West from the East. Do you know what he said to me? I'll tell you. He said, the West is the home of liberty, of efficiency, and of financial success. Desiring these things, I traveled to the West. I lived in various countries for years. Instead of what I sought, I found injustice, selfishness, and poverty. What was the use of going to the West? 
You see, it's not a question of looking for a crock of gold which doesn't exist beyond a rainbow. It's a question of where to go, when to go, and what preparation to make. So reality can exist without even the most well-intentioned person being able to find it, mainly because he is not correctly prepared. If correct preparation is needed to see reality, then what preparation is needed for prayer? I have a hunger to pray. Can prayer only be taught by someone who knows how to pray? And how can I find such a person or enter such a study? You are visualizing, without allowing yourself to realize it, the faculty of prayer as something which can be given to you as if it were, say, a bar of soap. Do you imagine that anyone would or could withhold from you the knowledge if you were ready to receive it. You must try to make yourself understand that man is not an inert lump which is to be processed or infused with something. Man is someone who can experience in accordance with his state. Man is a many-sided, versatile and wonderful being. He can learn to pray when he is prepared for it. Until you have realized this, you haven't started to prepare. All your previous studies are only an unconsummated potentiality. If you're not prepared to familiarize yourself with the preparatory materials which would make it possible for you to progress, to pray, and so on, then you're just a consumer in search of a product. And you should go to somebody who imagines, like you, that prayer can be given out, like a commodity, if you can only just find the right person. The overwhelming majority of the questions which I receive are structurally just the same question as this. They're the questions of a commercial mind seeking a supply and demand situation. Because they are couched in spiritual phraseology, this characteristic tends to be concealed from the questioner himself. Now, many of the subjects you've been discussing seem to fall within the areas of sociology, anthropology, psychology, and so on. Uh, where in all this is the spiritual and metaphysical content? It is a matter of first things first. For so long, in so many places, including the West as well as the East, groups and theories and studies have grown up which have been so mixed up with subjective human reactions and behavior that before we can get to the heart of the matter, we must clear away the undergrowth. We must prevent, for instance, the continuation of the habit of confusing one thing with another. One of the things which I'm trying to do is to help people in the West digest the discoveries of their own sociologists, anthropologists, and so on, who have pointed out that certain forms of emotionality or of repetitious behavior, for long considered, because of lack of knowledge, to have been manifestations of spirituality are in fact nothing of the kind. When we learn this, we can, as I say, get to the heart of the matter. Idris Shah, foremost authority on Sufism, was answering questions sent to him from all over the world. The list number of this cassette is double S-103. You'll be interested to know that double S-101 and double S-102 are also about aspects of Sufi thought and practice. WS101 is called a framework for new knowledge. In it, Idris Shah talks about Sufism and its role today. WS102 is called an ancient way to new freedom. Side one of the cassette contains a talk by Doris Lessing, who explores questions about Sufism. What is it? What is being taught? Is there something in it for me as an individual? Side 2 of WS 102 contains a description of a visit by the South African writer Daphne van Rennen to Langton House, where Idris Shah lives and works in England.